Okay, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. We are starting with our uh, final uh, class, and that is uh, lecture number 14 of this series on Python programming. So let's start. Okay, Ahmed and Haitham, you guys can see the screen, right? Both of you. Yeah. You can see. Okay. Yeah. So we will be talking about K N N classifier. We have been discussing the topics that come in the domain of machine learning. We have, we have been studying Python and we have extended our course to into the domain of machine learning. We have considered and studied the decision trees, random forest, uh, K means cluster, and then K N N classifier. This is our last topic, and uh, today we will end our uh, series of Python programming classes. And then I hope to see you back in, in, in the next course that is on machine learning, inshallah. So let's start. In today's class, uh, we will talk about the introduction to KNN classifier, KNN intuition, steps for KNN classification, uh, KNN classifier algorithm, some points to keep in mind, disadvantages, advantages, and so on and so forth. And then we will consider the Python implementation as well. So what's KNN classifier? K N N K nearest neighbor. K N N stands for K K nearest neighbor. K nearest neighbor is a it's a very simple uh, algorithm. It's easy to understand and it's versatile and one of the top most machine learning algorithms. K N N algorithm assumes that similar th things exist in close proximity. It's like we like your neighbor. Uh, we are like our neighbors. And it is a saying that uh, a person can be identified or recognized based on his uh, friends. So a good person will have good friends and a bad person will have bad friends, so and so forth. So it's, it, it basically comes from that philosophy that K, uh, the pixels, if suppose we are talking about an image, then that pixel will be most likely like its pixels neighbors, closest neighbors. So if we have a data point, it belongs to a category that it neighbors belong to. So it's the basic. This is the basic logic behind this uh, KNN algorithm classifier. So KNN is a non-parametric and lazy learning algorithm. Non-parametric means that uh, there is no assumption about the underlying data distribution. The model structure is, uh, you know, uh, there is not, no uh, mathematical formula or assumption about the underlying data. And this is very helpful because in real world data sets, uh, they don't follow any particular mathematical model as such. There, are, uh, there aren't any theoretical assumptions, mathematical and theoretical assumptions about those data sets. So it's non-parametric means that does not need that kind of model. Uh, the second thing is lazy learning algorithm. Lazy learning algorithm is, as you know, name, as the name suggests, it's lazy learning. So it does not, we don't have to train it like the other, like neural networks or the other uh, algorithms. We don't have to put an effort to train the algorithm. However, when we do the testing, it has to do a lot of efforts. So uh, it does, we don't have to train the algorithm and put an effort to train it. And it does, it does not uh, do a lot of effort in uh, learning the data set. But when it comes to implementation at that time, it has to put in the effort. So therefore, we call it lazy learning algorithm. Just like you know, you guys don't prepare. For example, don't prepare for your exam. Then during the exam, you would have a tough, tough time. So it, this type of algorithm uh, is that kind of thing that we it does. We don't have to put a lot of effort in training purpose. But when the testing comes, then this it is designed in such a way it has to really work hard at that time. So it simply uh, agrees with the laws of nature. So let's move on. Wait a second. Okay, I hope you guys can see this figure right now. What uh, do you see in the figure? Yes, Ahmed? Yeah. What do you see in the figure? Uh, a graph. Yes, uh, you can see a graph. Okay, Haitam, what do you see in this figure? Aitam, what do you see in this figure? Two categories and a data point without a category. 
yes there's a category one there's a category two and then there's a new data point in between that category one has red color category two has green color so assume we have a data that consists of two independent variables x1 and x2 x1 is on the x-axis and x2 on the y-axis the distribution of the data points in the given is in the given figure let, let us assume that data point in the red belong to a class or category one and the others the green belong to category two we have a new data point and we don't want we don't know uh, to which category it belongs it's some new you know newcomer you can think of that and we want to find out to which category it does it belong so there, that's actually the problem we have to classify it into category one or category two so what happens is that when we perform the knns classifier then it will as, uh, assign this new data point to one of the two categories, to either to red or green. Uh, at the end of Canon classifier, we will be able to tell whether the new data point belongs to class one or class two. So this is what the purpose of Canon classifier is. Now, how does it do that? That's an important question. We will be answering that question. So steps for Canon classification. First of all, choose the number of K neighbors. We have to choose or identify the number of k neighbors usually we take k is equal to 5k is always odd number we don't take even number k is the number of uh, the neighbors of the new data point if we say that k is 5 this means that we'll be considering five neighbors five different neighbors of that new data point then after that take take the k nearest neighbor of the new data point in, if we have to consider five in this case, five near, we can even have uh, you know, three or seven as well. But right now, let's consider K to be five. We will consider K nearest neighbor, neighbors of new data point according to the distance parameter, usually taken the Euclidean distance. Now, we what we do is for, from each for the given new data point, uh, we find its distance from each of the nearest five data points, five other data points. So, uh, so uh, the distance is calculated and the distance is calculated on some in some way. One of the ways to find the distance is uh, uh, Euclidean distance. Then after that, uh, the, the next step is count. Among these K neighbors, count the number of data points in each category. So uh, we find out the distance. Uh, uh, from the nearest neighbors and then we identify or uh, we note down the we already have the information about uh, their categories to which they belong and then we say that uh, how many of them belong to the uh, to category one and how many of them belong to category number two then after that is the next step is assign assign the new data point to the category where you counted the most neighbors so what you did was you counted the neighbors of the data point and the neighbors they fell in they fell into one category suppose uh, most of them fall, fell into one category and some of them fell a lesser number fell into the other category then you will say that this new data point must belong to that first category so it, it's pretty simple so uh, yes Haitham, can you please summarize what i've just told you how that does it work yes Haitham. I didn't understand it too well, but I think you start by taking a random number of of uh, data points. Uh, first of all, we have we uh, first of all we have the data points. Assuming that you have the data, data can be in a form of anything. It can be an image. It can be a series of numbers. It can be you know uh, the prices of uh, the uh, prices of houses and their uh, square foot square feet area and their prices can be x2 the other variable or it may be anything else like for example it can be uh, temperature of a, uh, on a on some day on some summer day and uh, maybe the humidity level can be some the other quantity and so on so it can be anything we have data in that form then in step number one that is choose what's happening here Haitham. What are we doing in choose step, step number one? Um, 
you choose a number of data point neighbors? Yes. Um, we first of all set the value of k. k equals to five means five, we are considering five neighbors. When we set k one, then that is one neighbor. K is always set as odd number so that uh, there is no tie in it. In order to avoid tie, we set the odd numbers so that we always have you know one of the two one of the two categories at least. So we select the odd number of value for k. Then after that, we calculate the distance of the new data point from each of its five uh, with a k k nearest neighbors. Fi uh, k, k is equal to five. Suppose so then we will be finding the distance with five neighbors, and the uh, distance is. In, may, uh, found in such a way that uh, we have the you know five smallest distance you know the uh, starting from the closest neighbor then the next neighbor and then the next neighbor and so on we consider five of the neighbors which are the closest to that data point and then after that we check to which category do they belong and the if they belong to uh, category majority of them belong to category A, then we will assign category A to our new data point. If the majority of the data points five, uh, the the those five of the neighbors, they belong to the other category, we will assign our new data point that other category. So, what does it mean? Uh, they uh, when I say uh, yes, Amit, can can you please elaborate? When I say that the neighbor belongs to a particular category, what does that mean? Uh, yes, I mean, like looking at the like figure, the look at this started. figure. When I say category two or category one, a data point belongs to a category one or category two, what does that mean? Um, like if it's category one, it belongs to the uh, red stuff. If it's category two, it belongs to the other. Okay, yes, we can have uh, one category is, for example, one class. Uh, the other category may be considered as the other class. For example, you have a quantity like, you know, uh, we have uh, an image, and in, in that image, we have just two different things. One thing is chair and the other is the background. So uh, one category can be the chair, part of the chairs. So they, are, they are also, they are everything belonging to the chair is included in one category and everything that belongs to the background, that will be the second category. So uh, any pixel that is closest to the, any unknown pixel that is closest to the chair will be considered as the chair and any pixel that is closer to the background will be considered as the background. It, it's that thing. The category categories are the classes. You have to classify the given data into two groups, two or two classes or two categories. Category one or two, or maybe they can be other categories as well. So uh, nearest neighbor. Now let's see that how this works within with this example, graphical example. Uh, are you people following and are you comfortable with the uh, slides or uh, is it hard to understand? Yes, I want feedback from you guys. It's mostly understandable. Uh, you can you people follow it? You can you understand it, or is it totally you know you people are lost? You are not following it at all. Yes, Haitham. And can you speak a bit louder so that I can hear you? It's okay. Uh, yes, sorry, sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, it's okay. Okay, good. Then it's fine. It's okay. Okay, so uh. Can classifier algorithm. Let us assume that we have a new data point. Like uh, I'm talking about the same example. We are we will be considering it in a bit more detail. So let us assume that we have a new data point and we want to classify it as belonging to category one or category two. We have two classes. One is category one and the second class is category two. And actually, this is the purpose of this machine learning classifier that it classifies the data into the different classes. Like, for example, if you give an image of a room, it has different objects in it. Those objects can be considered as different classes. 
that is for example it belongs to the background or the foreground or table or chair these are different you can consider them as different classes so here our we have only just two classes and we are calling them category one and category two and we want to know about this given new data point whether that whether it belongs to category one or category two so to do to to do this we will use some distance metric uh, we will use some criteria metric means that we will be distance metric means that we will use some distance criteria we will find out the distance of this new data point from the other data points from the rest of the data points so in our case in the case of in this uh, in today's topic that is KNN classifier we don't have to calculate the distance from all the data points but rather we focus on the neighbors and five of the neighbors we will be finding distance with the five of the neighbors and most often the distance that we can use is called the euclidean distance yes ahmed what do you know about euclidean distance anything if you have heard anything about it previously no you haven't heard about it Okay, we will talk about the distances in a uh, next slide. Here we have that slide. This is called the Euclidean or Euclidean distance. We have two points, P1 and P2. P1 has the coordinates x1, y1, and P2 has the coordinates x2, y2. Okay, we have two different points, P1 and P2, with their coordinates x1, y1, and x2, y2, respectively. And we want to find out the distance between these two points. So the formula that you can see on the screen is actually the formula that is used to find the Euclidean distance. We subtract the values of x between the two points and square them. Then we subtract the value of uh, y2 and y1. It can be y1, y2 as well as y2, y1 does not make any difference because we are squaring up, squaring them up. So the negative sign goes away. So we square them up, we add them together, and then we take this square root of the distance actually what we are doing is that there's a kind of triangle that forms uh, 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 as over here and we are finding the calculating the hypotenuse length of the hypotenuse side how is that so Haitham, can you please identify that how is this a triangle how can i see a triangle over here in the figure where's the triangle yes Haitham. i I don't know. Yes. Now speak a bit louder so that I can I hear you. I have no idea. Uh, can try to look, uh, try to imagine a triangle uh, present here in the figure. Can you somehow make a right angle mm -hmm. triangle there? Oh, yeah. Where is it? Uh, what do we call the 90 degree angle? Where would it lie? Where x2 and y1 collide? Yes, uh, where the line x1 crosses x2, the 90 degree angle, right angle rise there. Yes, exactly. So one side is the perpendicular and the other is the base. The base is the, uh, the perpendicular side is from that, uh, from y1 to y2 on the, along x2. If we move along x2 and we move from y1 up to, up till y2, that uh, side is that unlabels i let me put my cursor over there it's somewhere over here so from my cursor up to point p2 we have the perpendicular side and from my cursor to p1 that is the base so we square the base and we square the perpendicular and then them add them together that and take a square root that gives the length of the hypotenuse that is exactly what's happening here so we are actually finding the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle and that is what we call the euclidean distance so we calculate this is how we calculate the Euclidean distance. So in our case, for our unknown new data point, we will be calculating this Euclidean distance between that unknown point and five of the neighbors. Five of, we will be finding the distance with five neighbors. So those five distances are calculated. Uh, and out of those distances, actually, we will be calculating a lot of distances, but the distances which are the smallest of the five distances we will be considering considering those distances and we will be considering those points where the distances are smallest so five of those points 
you know you can think of an ascending order starting from smallest distance and and we pick up the neighbors which have the smallest distance and from that set we have a, we are considering five of the neighbors and we check their we check their category or the class to which they belong so this is what is you can see here in the in this slide uh, we have you know we have one two three of the data points are here and we have two data points over here so this is our unknown data point we calculate the distance from this data point to this one this red data point then this next red data point and then this red, red data point and then we calculate the distance with these of the data the all the distance from all the other data points they will be greater than those five distances the closest or the small shortest smallest value of distance would be with with this data point this is red colored then comes this one maybe this one and then this one and then after that this 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 point comes and this point uh, last green point comes here so the distances are calculated and those data points which have the which are five of the from all the data points five of the point data points which are closest to this given data point they are separated out shortlisted and then once they have been shortlisted their categories to which they belong are identified checked that whether they belong to class or category a or class second class or this category two category one or category two so you can see that uh, in the five of the closest neighbors how many of them belong to category one yes ahmed can you please tell me three yeah. yes three of them belong to category one and two of them belong to category two so what does what do you conclude from this uh, the new data point should belong to which category according to knn uh, one yes exactly that it should belong to category one because three of the neighbors belong to category one and only two neighbors belong to category two so majority of the neighbors k5 neighbors they belong to category one and minority belong to category two therefore this new will be classified as belonging to category one so this is the purpose of this algorithm it classifies the unknown data point to category one or category two so this is how it works i hope you guys have quite understood this well understood it quite well so this new data point belongs to category one and uh, you can see that category one one is to three neighbors and then you have uh, you know two to two neighbors category one has three neighbors category two has uh, two neighbors therefore we assign category one to the new data point so the, you can see that it has become red so this means that this model is ready this new data point it has been cl uh, classified or categorized as category one so this is the way how can algorithm work now you can see in this uh, slide we have a number of different ways in which we can calculate the distance we had cons considered the euclidean distance uh, this is how we take the distance we basically we subtract the um, we subtract the x values of x from the uh, the uh, uh, we subtract the values of x from the uh, data point to if you are talking about two data points we subtract their x coordinates and square them up and then we sub, sub, uh, subtract the uh, y coordinates and square them up and take a square root that gives us the euclidean distance similarly we can have other types of distances like you know here you have uh, x is one point and y is the other point so what we do is we take the mod of the distance we take the mod of the distance and square them up that is called a manhattan distance because because of the the city, this the city of manhattan has uh, the, if you have ever gone there they have uh, roads and streets they are always perpendicular to each other so if you have to you know move diagonally then you have to move zigzag because all the ro roads are you know perpendicular to each other so there is no diagonal road as such you have to go left then you have to go to maybe right and then left and right and in this way you make a diagonal so we call they call it manhattan distance so manhattan distance actually you uh, take the difference of the values of x and take a mod 
and then add with the difference of uh, the values of y and take a mod. So in our case, if we go back here in this equation, in case of Manhattan distance, what would be happening? Can any one of you tell me what uh, changes would you do to the square root and squares in this uh, formula? Yes. OK, no response. So we will replace this square by a mod. We will replace this square over y 2 minus 1 1 by a mod, mod. And then we will remove this square root. You know how we take mod? Item, how, what is mod? How do we take mod? Yes, Haitam. I didn't have it quite yet. <clears throat> so you please speak a bit louder. Your voice is quite <clears throat> low. I don't uh, know yet. Uh, mod, when we take mod of any number, then we remove its sign. Actually, we're talking about the magnitude of that number. If I say we have minus 2, then when we take the mod of that, minus 2, that becomes 2. So this means that we are talking about the magnitude of the number. We, have, we ignore the sign or remove the sign or don't consider the sign. So more, when we take, take mod of minus 2, that, it, that is equal to 2. When we take mod of 2, that is equal to 2 again. So when we take mod of a distance, we make it positive in some way. We can say that we have made it positive. We have removed the negative sign from it. So when we are taking the mods of the distance, difference of points, coordinates, then we simply, what we, we have done is that we remove the sign from that. So they simply add, add up together. When we add them together, they simply add together because they all are positive numbers. After taking mod, they become modded, uh, positive numbers. So we have Minkowski. Uh, at a distance uh, it's a kind of normed distance and you find the distance you raise to the power q and then you take the uh, qth root uh, it is some way you are taking the norm of that uh, qth norm of that distance so there are different kinds of distances but the most common one is the euclidean distance which we have already seen uh, so let's uh, put the things together and summarize them up uh, the important points to select the K that's right for your data, we run the KRN algorithm several times with the different values of K and choose the K that reduce, reduces the number of errors encountered while maintaining the algorithm's ability to accurately make predictions when it it's given data. It hasn't uh, when it's given data, it hasn't seen before. So K is chosen by taking different values of K and running the algorithm several times and checking when it gives the least amount of errors, that value of K is adopted as the um, K neighbors. Okay, so this is how we select it. As we decrease the value of K to one, our predictions become very unstable. So when we reduce K to one, then it becomes very unstable. Inversely, if we increase K, our predictions become more stable, but they make a lot of errors. The errors go up as well. So we have to, take you know a, a compromise make a compromise or something that is in between not so small k and not so large k so the you know sweet spot lies in between the these two values in case where we are uh, taking a majority vote uh, the mode in the classification among the labels we usually k odd number we usually take k to be odd number so that it's a tie breaker we don't get a tie actually so this is the whole story OK, so let's move on a few more of the points. You can see a graph over here. Uh, when K is small, the train data has smaller error, but we have test data has a very large error. But then as you increase the value of K, the train error goes up and the, uh, the test error remains stable. Then it goes up and then quickly falls down. So you can see that that sweet spot that I was talking about that was k is equal to 8. For k is equal to 8, we have a smaller test error, and even the train error is also small. So they are lie together. After that, the test error goes up, and the train error slightly goes up. So uh, for smaller values, that's not good. 
maybe maybe the train error is less but the test error is is uh, bad which means that we have overfitting or this means that on the training data set our program is working fine but when we give it new data point it fails that's happening at smaller values of k but when we go and to large values of uh, k then uh, you can see that it is performing adequately maybe for the uh, training set but for test set it is again doing bad but for this k is equal to 8 that is an intermediate value your test uh, 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 that it's going fine on test set as well as on the train set so uh, therefore i was saying that we have to find this uh, k value after running the algorithm several times now the advantage let's quickly see the advantages then we'll go to the python code uh, advantages are th uh, that the algorithm is simple and easy to implement there is no need to build a model and tune several parameters or make additional assumptions we don't need to do that the algorithm is versatile it can be used for classification regression and search etc and then uh, eager learning algorithm versus lazy learning algorithm uh, as you have seen knn is a lazy learning algorithm what are eager learning algorithms? When we give training data points, we construct a generalized model before performing prediction on given new points to classify them. We have to train the algorithm. And then we make prediction on new points uh, before we can use them in the field. So we mm, uh, run that algorithm on training data, then we run them on the, on the test data. You can think of such learners as being ready, active, and eager to classify unobserved data points. So when we give them new data points, they are ready to handle those. Whereas the lazy learning algorithms are such that they don't need learning or training of the model for all the data points used at the time of prediction. Lazy learning algorithms wait until the last minute before they classify any data point. So lazy learning algorithms, they wait for when you give them data, they wait and then they start working when you give them data. So they have to work harder than the eager learning algorithms. Lazy learning learners store merely the training data set and waits until the class. So in, in lazy learners, they just store the data, data set given to them. They don't need to store anything else. They just store the data set and then use that to classify. So uh, then there's a curse of dimensionality. This means that uh, the if you increase the number of data points, then KLR, K, KNL, uh, you know, it, it performs better on smaller number of uh, features and uh, then on larger number of features it it performs better on smaller number of features so uh, you can say that when we increase the number of features it needs more data then increase the increase in dimension also lead, leads to the problem of overfitting uh, basically it, this is what we call the uh, the problem of having higher dimension is called the curse of dimensionality. That's the term used in machine learning. Anyways, let's quickly move on. Uh, about KNNs, its disadvantages, the algorithm gets significantly slower when the data points are very large. And the algorithm needs to determine the value of K for which K, K which may be complex sometimes. And uh, KNN's main disadvantage uh, of becoming significantly slower as the volume of data increases. So it's the drawback of KNN is that when the data set is big, it becomes very slow. Are you guys following me with me? Yes, Saitam Mahmud? Yeah. Okay. So moreover, there are faster algorithms that can produce more accurate classification regression so KNN is not a very good algorithm it's a, you know for bigger data sets it's smaller but for smaller data sets it works quite fine so it may be used for smaller data sets and uh, because of its simplicity we that that will be the main reason why people use it and it is it can be used in recommender systems recommender systems what do you know about recommender system yes Ahmed. you must have used the recommender systems we always in fact we always use them online What's a recommender system? I don't know. Uh, for example, you make a purchase on some website and uh, you you are ready to you are you maybe you have purchased something or you are buying something. Uh, this website offers a few more things to sell. Why? Because the people 
uh, like you who have bought the same thing that you are buying, they also bought few other things. Therefore, they present offer those things to you so that maybe you get interested in buying those as well. Because the people who are who buy who purchase those things that you are purchasing, then this means that you are similar to those people. And if you are similar to those people, then you are belong to the same category. And if you belong to the same category, then this means that you must be offered the same products. So, uh, it, it will be very likely that you will buy them. So the recommender systems they use KNN KNN classifier, and it's extensively used. So the 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 people who buy something you know one certain product, and they also bought product B and C. Then, if you purchase that product, uh, the website will offer those, those product B and C as well to you, so that uh, it will be very likely that you will buy them as well. Because uh, people are like, like their neighbors, it's the assumption of KNN classifier. And uh, if a neighbor is buying something, then you, it's highly likely that you will be buying the same thing. So, now let's uh, look at the Python implementation. First of all, let's quickly see the different steps that we follow in the machine learning. Uh, program and algorithm. And first of all, we import the libraries. In our Python code, we import the libraries. Then we import the data set. Then we split the data set into training and the sampling and testing samples. Then we do the feature scaling so that uh, the features can be compared and comparison can be made on those features easily. Uh, some features may be you know, giving us a, a bigger absolute values than the other value and other uh, features. So we have to make bring them on a common ground. Then after that, we train the model. Then we predict the new results. Then we predict uh, the test results and uh, make a you know evaluate that how uh, correctly we have uh, our algorithm has uh, uh, predicted the test results. Then we make a confusion matrix. Confusion. We will see what a confusion matrix is. And then after that, we visualize the training set results, and, and then we visualize the test set results, and then we are done. This is normally uh, the parts of a a standard uh, machine learning program that we normally use and the kind of program that we will be considering today as well. So let's first of all see that we will be importing the libraries. First of all, we will import the NumPy. We always do that. It is used for processing the arrays. Then we, the, uh, the, then we import the other libraries like matplot library, which is used for plotting. Then we have uh, the our main uh, library that is sklearn. From sklearn, uh, we are using the neighbors module, and from there we are importing this k neighbor classifier method. And then uh, model selection, we import the train set split. Then from k uh, sklearn, we uh, mo uh, matrix module, we import the confusion matrix and accuracy score. We will be using this these two uh, methods today. And then we have, another thing that we have done over here is that we have generated the data randomly. We can even import the data from some source. We can even measure it. We can generate the data. But here, we are randomly generating uh, generating this uh, 100 random numbers having two features each. And uh, then after that, we give them the categories. Like if, for example, the in the second column, if the value is less than five, it is given the red color. Otherwise, it's given the blue color. So the based on the values, uh, the values are from zero to ten. So from zero to five, it's red color. From five, uh, from zero to less than five, and then from five to ten, it's blue color. So in this way, we categorize, uh, gave them different colors, and that is our output or the label or the Y. So this is how we uh, assign the labels to our data points. So we have generated the data points. We have hundred of those data points. They have two features, and from the second column. We are picking up their values, and if the value is between zero and four, then it's given a red color label, and if it is uh, between five and ten, it's given a blue color label, and those labels are stored in our while variable. So this is what we have done. Now then, after that, we split the data into the training set and the test set, like we have done in our previous case. So we use train, te uh, train, test, split, x, y. And uh, test size is equal to 0, 03. This means that 30% of them are used for testing purpose, 70% of them used for training purpose. It's a pre pretty normal way how we do it. And then we set the random state to 42. We can set it to 0, maybe. It's just a number. So that each time when we turn the run the program, it starts from the same initial state. So yes, Ahmad, are you following this code up till now? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So after that, we create the KNN classifier with five neighbors. We have to tell our program uh, the number of neighbors. So we say KNN is equal to, we create this uh, object of this uh, particular class, K neighbors classifier, with the number of neighbors is equal to five. So with K is equal to five, we specify, create our uh, uh, KNN uh, object. Then after that, we train it. KNN dot fit, we are using the fit method over here. And to fit method, we give the X train input, the 70% of the data that we randomly generated that belongs to X train that is given to it and corresponding Y train. The labels that are red color or the blue color, they are also passed on to this <clears throat> uh, function fit and it trains the um, uh, uh, KNN classifier with the name KNN for us. After that, we evaluate it, how well it is trained. So for that, we use the accuracy score and we give the Y test data and Y predicted data to this. Uh, we give it the Y test and the Y predicted. So we we have to find those Y predicted as well as the where that we will see that in the whole program. Let me let me share that. We have to predict that. If you look over here, look at this line is, we missed this line. Make predictions, line number 28. Can you guys see line number 28 here? In line number 28, you can see Y predict is equal to KNN Y predict X test. We give the X test data to the predict method, which is uh, which uh, applies the, the prediction or uh, on our KNN uh, object. In line number 29, so we pass this uh, pass this data x test as data is given to uh, uh, the predict method, and the classification takes place. You know we have given the uh, x test data to our KN classifier, and it predicts for us the values of y. Y contains the colors red or blue, whatever. So we give the test data to it, and it predicts the data for us. So this is what is, has happened in this uh, line number 28 and 29. Coming back to the lecture. So after that, we have our pred Y predicted ready. We have Y test, the test data, which uh, we already know they have the labels. And the predicted value are the values that our classifier has predicted those values. And then the accuracy score makes a comparison of that value and find out the accuracy, how accurate our result was. And then after that, we have the confusion matrix. We create a confusion matrix. So first let us understand what's a confusion matrix. Uh, a confusion matrix is a table that is used to define the performance of a classification algorithm. A confusion matrix visualizes and summarizes the performance of a classification algorithm. So what's a confusion matrix? Yes, Ahaitam. Yes, Haitam. It visualizes the performance of an algorithm. Yes, it visualizes the performance of an algorithm. What it uh, what is is it telling us? If you look at this table, you can see there is uh, on the left hand side it's written predicted values on the top it's written actual values and then below that in the first cell or the first uh, square on this table we have tp tp stands for true positive and we have positive one and positive uh, predicted values positive and the actual values are also positive this means that it's a true positive i've also given explained this thing in the earlier classes will suppose there's the so suppose uh, we have a fire alarm and when it uh, rings this means that it's a positive output it's uh, you know it's uh, telling us something and it's the output is one you can say that the output is positive and then the other thing is that if we have a fire then let's say that uh, 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 the 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 fire alarm is predicting positive when it is ringing and the actual value when there is a fire then 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 we will have one for that which means that we have actually we have a fire 
when we don't have a fire then the value will be negative or zero so that will be uh, we don't have a fire and when the alarm is ringing then the predicted value has one when the alarm is not ringing then the predicted value has zero got it so we have this kind of situation so when there is a fire and the alarm is ringing this means that it's a true positive alarm is ringing it's saying that it's positive and true positive which means that actually there is a fire and it is telling us that yes there is a fire we call it true positive and uh, then we ha can have a false positive or a false alarm there is no fire which means that actually uh, the value is zero or negative but when the predicted value is the predicted value is one which means that the alarm is ringing so this is a false positive there is no fire but the alarm is ringing so it's called a false positive got it so similarly we can have a negative when the alarm is not ringing which means that the predicted value is negative and when we say that there is no fire and the alarm is not ringing then it's a good uh, correct situation there is no fire and the alarm is also not ringing it's a normal situation we call it true negative true negative means that it's a true negative which means that the alarm is uh, not ringing and there is no fire there is no emergency situation but the dangerous situation is that there is uh, the alarm is not ringing which means that it's not showing us that there is fire but in fact there is a positive actual positive there is a fire so that is a false negative false never negative is very dangerous situation uh, the whole purpose for which alarm was installed it is not being fulfilled or matter it's not doing its job uh, we we basically install a fire alarm to predict fire uh, to find out predict fire when there is fire when there is fire and it's not telling us there is fire that means that alarm has failed it's called false negative got it yes now can any one of you tell me about the confusion matrix yes ahmed can you please tell us it's a different algorithm it shows you the values what you have it visualizes it it basically uh, summarizes all the possibilities we are basically talking about classification algorithm the algorithm classifies you know uh, how does an algorithm classify you have a fo image a photo of a dog or a not dog dog or a not dog it does it is a dog or it is not a dog and that's actual thing and then there is your algorithm which tells you that yes it is a dog or it is not a dog so you will have four different situations if it is a dog and your algorithm also tells you yes it's a dog it's called a true positive and it falls in the top left uh, square and that's a good thing it's done its job and then comes the square next to it right on the right hand side of it fp false positive then when you give a picture of a cat for example something that is not dog but your algorithm is saying it is a dog it's a called it's a false positive it's a, actually not positive but it's a false positive actually it's not a dog but your algorithm is telling you that it's a dog it's making a mistake so it's a false positive and then you go to the next line below it on the left side you have fn it's a false negative so when actually it's a dog you actually show image of a dog to your algorithm and it says that no it's not a dog so it's making a mistake here and we call it false negative it's actually a dog but your algorithm is giving you wrong answer that's not a dog that's called a false negative then after that in the bottom right square you can see T and true negative. Then again, it's a good situation. True negative. Then when you don't, you when you give a picture of a not dog, something like cat or something else, but not dog. When you give that image to your classifier, and classifier says that it's not a dog. Then again, it's a good thing. It's done its job. It's right, giving you the right result that it's not a dog and. It's
telling you that it's not a dog. So true negative is also correct answer. So this is what this whole situation, these all these possibilities are summarized by the confusion matrix. Got it now? I hope you got, you guys have understood it. Yeah. In our case in our Python code, you can see that uh, the Python code we use the confusion matrix. We data. We give it the actual data, and we give it the data which is predicted by our algorithm. The test data is that data that is the output that is the supposed to be output. Why predicted is the actual output that our algorithm has given us. Because we give the X test to our uh, um, classifier, and we already know that what is the Y test for that X test, but we don't let the algorithm see that. But rather, we give it a chance to predict it. We give it X test, and it gives us Y predicted. We have two. It's like Y test is like the solution of your test, and uh, Y predicted you can think of as your exam or the test. Y predicted is the uh, solution that you give. Y test Y predicted is. Uh, uh, I mean, it's the it's the solution that you as a student give of your ex for your exam. Your performance is exam is Y predicted. And its solution, which your instructor gives you after checking the exam or uses for checking the exam, is the Y test. And you can see your mistakes by making a comparison. So exactly the same thing is happening here. Comparison is being made when confusion matrix is making that comparison. Here you can see that we have uh, true positives are the 12 true positives, which is a good thing. Then we have uh, true negatives, which is 16. Again, it's a high number, good thing. Then we have uh, zero uh, false positives, which is again good. There was no mistake in that. But here, two mistakes are made in the false negative. False negative are serious things. Uh, you know, false when the thing in case of fire alarm, false negative is a serious situation. Then serious thing. Where it means that two times fire break, did break out, but the alarm did not ring. We can think of that in that way. So this is the confusion matrix which our code will generate. And then after that, uh, we will create a scatter plot. So scatter plot is uh, created using this uh, PLD dot scatter, and X contains one uh, uh, or first column, and Y contains the second column for the second feature. And then you can see uh, we give it the values of color as Y is red or blue. We are giving we have only two categories, so we are giving those values. Then after that, uh, on X axis, we say feature one on Y axis, we say feature two and then title is given and then we show it. So this is what we get in the, in the display. So the red dots are cat red dots are put into the blue with the blue color into the sec other second category and red in the first category in any new data which we can check. We can find out it to which uh, uh, it belongs to to which category does it belong to. Now, before I share with you the code, let's take a quick look. Logistic regression is a type of machine learning technique. It gives us accuracy of 89%. KNN gives. In the example that I have haven't shown you, there was an example test. Some use case you can think of that. 89% uh, accuracy was through logistic regression. Then KNN gave us 93%, and we improved the accuracy by 4%. KNN is a non-parametric algorithm, which means it does not make any assumption on the underlying data. And uh, it's also a lazy learning algorithm. So uh, with this, let me look, show you the uh, pro today's Python code. Let's look at it. So we have this uh, program. Let's run it. It has generated this this graph for us one thing that it has done you can see that can you guys see this code a graph yes yeah yes i'm okay and the other thing that uh, it has done is this it has created the confusion matrix this is our confusion matrix which you can see here 12 and 0 and 12 and 16 I uh, wrote this thing in a you know, neat and presentable way, but the program gives us the result in this way. This is 12 is our uh, true positives, zero is false positive, then we have false negatives, and then true negatives, TN are 16. So this is our confusion matrix. 
and uh, 93, 0, 0.93 is the accuracy. In our case, it, it has given us the accuracy of 93%. Now, uh, let's look at another program. Let's run it. Here you can see that we had this data set, which you can see in line number 13 and 14. We have some numbers, and they are given uh, different colors. And then we give it a, then we do the same kind of stuff, printing it, and then uh, import the required libraries, etc. And then we create the uh, accuracy uh, score in line number 30. And then after that, we test it on a new data. In line number 38, you can see new data. New data contains 9 and 11, and we want to we use our classifier to predict that this belongs to which category red or blue which one so this thing is done in this uh, line number 39 uh, we use kn predict and we give it new data new data is 9 and 11. these are just the values of x and y coordinates you can think of them and then gives us the predicted class in line number 39 and that says 2 2 is blue color so this means that this data point is close to the, you can think of the data set in line number 13, 14. The bigger the values of X and Y are, they are blue color. Smaller values belong to the red category. So uh, since we have a bigger value, 9 and 11, it must belong to the blue category. So it must have calculated the distance. We have not seen that right now, but that thing is done by the predicted, uh, by predict method and uh, using our KNN cl classifier. And that thing gives the uh, value, predicts the uh, class that is blue for this particular data point. Now, let's uh, finish it off. I'm sharing the file with you. And what you guys have to do is you have to run that on your uh, spider IDEs and show me the result. I'm sending you the file through WhatsApp. Please open up your spider IDEs. I'm sending you both programs. Uh, let me know if you have got those. Yes. Okay, Ahmad, can you please uh, run this uh, program uh, number two file, which contains two at Please share your screen and show us. Yes, Haitham. Yeah, sorry, Ahmad. Okay. Share your screen and run it and show us. Yes, Ahmed, is it running? Hold on. It's not running. Please share your screen and show us. Have you downloaded the file? Yeah. Okay, put it in your uh, documents folder uh, where you put other Python code and run it, please. and share your screen with us. Okay, now we can see your screen. So is it running fine? Mm -hmm. Yes, it gives you the 
give the give you the right answer okay that's fine now please run the other program as well okay acha uh, please run the other program and uh, and i will be uh, sharing the take home exam with you guys you have to uh, do that take home exam honestly uh, of course and uh, you will have one week for it and uh, it's it, it will be your main final exam for this course so you have to pass that uh, uh, exam actually and for this you cannot uh, take help of anyone uh, any other person you can use the resources like the uh, the books or the internet but you are not allowed to use the ai or a human person uh, take take help from them and then you have to share that with me and based on that uh, i will share your result and this this is going to be our final class of this uh, course on python please share uh, 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 okay your uh, where is the graph this is your second program or first one uh second okay share the other one as well i am not working uh, show uh, open that other one as well and then run it it's crashed my spider I can't see your screen right now uh, the the other program my spider's crashed okay uh, you can uh, turn it again open it uh, open your spider again if it is doing anything you know it's if it is creating any problem but do show us the other program you can close this file okay hitam can you please uh, share your screen and show us this second program which uh, hitam uh, which amit did not show us the other one Yes, Haytham. Yes. Something. It just stops working every single time. it says that module sk learn you have to install that sk learn last time you, i think you ins you installed some software maybe or un in uninstalled something that it got uh, you uh, you have to uh, try that out uh, what was that last time we we saw oh, that last time updated. you have to uh, go to the powershell and you have to write install the sk learn sk you have to write the na complete name of this this library sk learn like remember this. last time we i and uh, if you go back if you go if you refer to the oh wait if you refer to you whatsapp uh, don't share your screen you have, since your screen is shared uh, so if uh, ahmed can tell you the 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 the, the command that you have to write in that is conda install scikit learn conda install scikit learn conda install what conda install scikit learn scikit learn yes conda install scikit dash learn so, 
not dash uh, underscore not underscore dash minus minus Is it with a C or a K? Is it Scikit or Skykit? Like this. It's S C I K I T. Hmm. So is this right? Connor install Scikit learn. Yes. Okay. Looks fine. So in this way, your Scikit Learn library will be installed. Yes. yes. Okay, now you can restart your Spider IDE. Verifying transaction failed. Environment not variable error. Current user does not have right permissions to target environment. Verifying transactions field, preparing transactions done. Mm -hmm. The current user does not have a uh, right permissions to the target environment. You basically, you have to uh, install. You have to uh, install from after logging in as administrator. Then you have to uh, do it. If you log in with the administrative rights, then you do it again. I don't think there's another account. Yeah, there's no other account. So uh, you uh, you are uh, you have logged in as administrator or not? Oh, I'll be right back in. Yes. That actually, that's the issue. The issue lies here. Last time it was properly installed. You can be, can you please, uh, can Ahmed, can you please help him out? Uh, let him log off and log in again, and then, you know, do repeat this uh, scikit learn, conda install scikit learn. And then see that if it, the, uh, these SK scikit library gets installed. We don't have a minus over there, so I get none. Yes. Same. Field again, you have to log in with the administrative rights. I mean, uh, you have to log off. Ahmed, uh, are you there? Are you people sitting together or in some other places? Other places. Okay. Uh, in the same in the same house or other places far uh, away, far apart. Yes. Yeah. Ahmed and Haitham, you you people are aren't uh, in the same house right now. We are here. Yeah. Ahmed, can you please go to his PC and you know, check uh, check it that uh, it can be, uh, log him off and then log in again with uh, full administrative rights into the windows and then uh, try to repeat this whole stuff and see if uh, it works or not. Last time it did work. Yeah. Yes, Ahmed, please go and uh, uh, let him log off and then log in again. No, you have to come. In the meantime, you can log off and then log in again. You can, uh, you can disconnect from uh, Microsoft Teams uh, and then you can install, try to install it again. You can disconnect from Microsoft Teams and then you try to install it again.
Yes, Ahmed, have you reached uh, Aitam's computer? Yeah. Okay, you can uh, disconnect him from Teams, and then you can uh, install this using this Conda install scikit learn, and then uh, give me the feedback what have uh, if the issue has resolved or is it the same? Yes, any progress? No, can work. So, can you share the, uh, the screen last time? You know, last time uh, it did work, remember? Yep, and then it um, worked. And this time it's not working. Mm -hmm. Share your share screen and your spider ID. I the, sure. the, not just yes, spider ID, but. Okay, you can show your spider ID as well. Uh, in uh, can you write conda install here? No. Conda install. Bad. Okay. I don't know what that is. What is the error? Bad. Uh, it just says bad escape p. Bad escape p. Do it again and write it again, and don't press any key. Press enter. What does it say? Make okay. Bar escape slash p. Okay, let me try it also on Conda install. Let me check it install. Like it, learn. I uh, Last, if if we can recall, last time what did we what did happen? Uh, I think it was it was correctly installed, uh, wasn't it? Yes, uh, Haitham. Yeah. After that, did you install anything on your PC? Uh, nothing. I would change. I can't. I know. Did you change any configuration or anything that uh, it, it's working on other PC, it's working on my computer, and it's not working on your computer, it must be something related to Windows. What I can suggest is you have to uh, reinstall Anaconda again and then uh, try that out, try the uh, try installing this, this library again, the same way, Conda install 
scikit learn uh, can can you uh, uh, try the code here just for checking if it works or not open that file and run it which file that i shared uh, through whatsapp at uh, the files that i've shared today Oh, it worked. It's working. Mm -hmm. It's working. This means that uh, it was installed. Con that circuit library was installed. In fact, I just can you show the plot? Uh, so it's fine, working fine. There's no issue in it. So your uh, circuit learn is installed and it's working fine. Now. Uh, uh, with this, uh, let's end up today's, uh, uh, I mean, end up our, our uh, the series of, of Python uh, programming lessons, which we started about uh, one year ago. We took around uh, 40 uh, uh, classes, 40 around uh, 40 lectures. Some of them were more than one hour. Some of them were half, one and a half hours. Most of them were mostly uh, equal to one hour few of them were less than uh, one hour. So uh, let me admit, Ahmed. OK, so we are concluding our uh, series today, and I will give you a take home exam. Uh, all three of you, uh, including Sarin, Ahmed, and Haitham, all three of you have to do that take home exam, uh, the best possible effort. And based on that, your result will be finalized and shared with you. And after that, uh, I will be starting uh, the next uh, uh, course that is uh, machine learning. And we will be focusing on deep learning. And I hope you guys uh, will be interested in studying that course as well. I will talk to your dad regarding that uh, to finalize things. Uh, but for us, but till then, uh, you people have to do your uh, take home exam and uh, submit it to me. Then after that, we will decide that. So let's end our today's uh, session. Uh, let, let me stop the recording. Let's end our today's session. And uh, inshallah, we will meet again in the next session. Uh,